Welcome to the Orthopedic Indications channel, where we discuss medical education for medical sales consultants and reps. Okay, um, this was, hey, can you take a look at this, which is never a good thing when you have your partner <laughs> who does Achilles tendon surgery say, uh, can you take a look at this? And he says, uh, this patient had history of an Achilles surgery a couple of months ago, uh, done elsewhere. I don't really, not really comfortable managing this. Uh, initially they report that she's otherwise healthy. She's in her, she's a female. She hurt this, uh, her Achilles ruptured her Achilles in playing basketball. She did heal up. Okay. Initially, but then starts developing some wound issues. And this is what you see on the exam table. <laughs> So you Jeff, I'm kind of interested. What I think Jeff and I had similar facial reactions when we saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Not good. And I'm sure Not Bethany good. did too, but we just can't see her right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I've had that happen, not quite to this extent, but I have had people have kind of some reactions, not only to the posterior uh suture here, but sometimes, you know, tightrope or whatever it may be. I've had a few people have reaction to the suture and have to go in and take those out and uh, not too dissimilar from this. Yeah. yeah. And you can tell, I mean, just looking at this, you know, this before anything procedurally, that's that, you know, that looks like some fiber wire or something, something that has that core. Uh, and so yeah. certainly either, you know, deep infection or deep infection now, but um probably some reaction to some foreign material in this setting. So how are you managing this patient? You can maybe see where this is going to go, but. <laughs> yeah, you got to get all that out of there. Step one, open it up, clean it out, debride it. You know, questionable whether you do the do it all as primary or you just got to clean this out and take cultures and evaluate for underlying infection and, you know lab work and all that stuff first but you know you could you know typically it depends on what the quality of the tendon looks like so if the tendon has healed but then there's non-viable suture and and tendon around it you might get away with just debriding this but it kind of depends on you know did you say it re-ruptured or what did, did you say anything about the quality of the tendon um i have not i have a mri here let's see if it'll play it's a sagittal image here doesn't look awesome. No. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what we did. I, uh, Jeff, I'd be interested. I know that you just did an episode on antibiotic management, and I think you were talking a little bit about vancomycin powder. In, is that something you'd use? I mean, it maybe it sounds like you're using that on a lot of different cases, but you know, what's the, what, what are you doing in this case? Let's just say you're going to go in do a debridement, take all the foreign material out, debride the tendon, and just try to get the skin to heal as first step one. Uh, what's the role of, you know, how are you managing potential infection in that setting? Yeah, I mean, deep cultures and and identifying pathogens. But, um, you know, vanco the, the vancomycin study that, that we did when I was in residency uh, with Dr. Wukic was uh, in non-infected cases. It was more of a preventative measure. So, yes, I will use vancomycin in the infection setting. The article I was talking about was pretty much on all reconstruction cases, specifically in patients who have diabetes that are at high risk for infection. But yeah, I mean, I don't ever see a problem with putting vancomycin in there. Is it my only infection management? No, not necessarily. Not in an acutely infected case. You know, there's role for oral or IV antibiotics in addition to the top. I don't rely just on the topical vancomycin powder is what I'm saying in an acutely infected case. Jan, what do you think? Anything? No, I mean, like for this is, you know, I mean, I use Vank powder, uh, Tilbert powder quite frequently, um, but this is something where you think you just need an aggressive debridement um, and, you know, and get control of the infection uh, first. Uh, that's what I would worry about here. I I do like an antibiotic bead pouch, probably I'd stage this. This is probably at least two debridements for me. Uh, and then think about how I'm going to get it closed, whether it be a wound vac or, I have really good soft tissue, uh, plastic surgeons that I work with. So if they can, sometimes they can turn down a, a, a flap in this area, like a propeller flap to get it covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did, we went in, we did an, uh, a pretty aggressive debridement, like you said, 
uh, put an incisional vac on, um, you know, right away. I didn't put anything else, you know, in the, in the wound. I didn't put any, didn't try to repair anything with the tendon, basically just cut out everything that I could that looked not healthy and then just closed the skin primarily. It didn't look terribly infected. Um, we took cultures, as I recall, they didn't really grow much. Um, and if they did, it was kind of a non-specific thing and kept her on antibiotics uh, for a while until the skin healed up and ended up like going on to heal pretty uneventfully. Uh, surprisingly, I kept her immobilized. I, you know, I think on these, I'll oftentimes immobilize them in a splint and plantar flexion, take all the tension off of them, give the soft tissues rest. And it's amazing. Like once you get rid of all the foreign material, get the tendon adequately debrided, how you can actually get these to heal up. Okay. And then you come back to fight another day. Um, I'm curious that those who said like an antibiotic bead pouch, I think Jan said that, is that Jan, uh, can you comment on that? Is that something that you put just like a, the, the pouch in, let it sit for a couple of days and come back and take it out and then close it? Or is that, is that how you're managing that situation? Yeah. So I'm making, you know, with methyl methacrylate, so standard antibiotic cement mixed with high dose vanc and tobramycin, if I don't have a bug. And if I think it's fungal, you can add amphotericin as well. And I'll leave that for two to three days while the cultures are brewing. Um, and then, you know, plant, you know, I tell patients I'll do this in two stages. I, I, I let them know that right away. And I'm, I'm, you know, we take, we do that a lot in trauma, right. It, you know, yeah, read it once and then bring it back a second time, whether it be an open fracture or something like that. So I've kind of incorporated that into infections like this because this is limb salvage. You know, like if they develop a bad infection here, they're diabetic or something, they could easily, um, you know, potentially lose their foot. So yeah. Okay, so that's, go ahead, Jeff. I do. I do think it's interesting, like you said, that. When I've seen cases like this, I'm expecting much more infection than is actually present, whether it be with a uh, tightrope or any kind of suture. And I've found that I just take the suture out and they heal up like very quickly. It's almost like 90% driven by this the re four body reaction. And then maybe there's a superimposed uh, infection on top of it. But I'm always expecting far more infection than what I see when I get in there with these reactions. Yep. Yep. That's a good point. Okay, yeah, so because especially with fiber wire, right? There's multiple case reports and case series that they have the granul granulomatosis or gran you know granuloma reaction to this, so you know to the suture. So that's that's been well reported. So like I think you're right. You got to get the suture out. I think that's the case step number one. Yeah, for sure. So, so shockingly, she heals up. And she like, she get her out of her cast, get her back in her boot and eventually into some physical therapy. And I kind of say, all right, let's see how it goes. Uh, and, and, uh, kind of let her be not with any real big plans for any sort of reconstruction. And then she shows up maybe six months later, she's feeling pain and not a little bit of pain, but mostly like weakness, inability to kind of get back to activities, very limited. I think it was six months after the after the index. And so I repeated her MRI. Here's her MRI. So now what? How are you guys, how are you managing this? Um, I can play it again. Are you just saying, sorry, come back, go somewhere else? One way so ticket to Des Moines. <laughs> no, you can, you can keep it. Uh, <laughs> is it most, it looks like just mostly thick and scarred my camera's blocking a little bit, but the thick and scarred uh, tendon, is yeah. that where her pain is at the mid substance of that? Yeah, it's in the mid substance. She gets a little bit of pain in the heel too. I think, you know, sometimes when they get a little stretched out or weak, they have a little bit of difficulty kind of with push off. Yeah. Um, and so I repeated her labs. Her labs were all normal, white count, CRP, sed rate, all normal. And incision looks good. It's a little bit of a thick keloid, but otherwise looks fine without any, you know, in, without any issues. So what are you telling her? Does she have any Aquinas? Is there is there tightness back uh, there? If anything, she's loose. Okay. So yeah. that tells you. If anything, you. she's loose. If she was tight, you could maybe consider a gastroc and maybe some debulking of the tendon. But if she's loose, that's not going to that's not gonna reverse, typically. So FHL so, transfer. FHL transfer. Okay. Let's, so this would be, this is, I took this uh, video, you know, I don't know how well it shows. This is not exactly the same patient, but this was kind of a close follow-up where the image on the, 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 the picture closest to us, you can see decreased resting tension. 
relative to the one in the foreground or the background, um, it, it it's not projecting that great. But that's kind of the picture that you know decreased decreased resting uh, plantar flexion um, in in uh, in weakness. So let's talk through the FHL transfer. So we we talked about reconstructive options. I like the FHL uh, transfer in this case because we're using vascularized tissue uh, rather than bringing in you know other like an allograft or anything else, and especially in the history of infection. So I, I like that option a lot in this patient. But Jeff and Jan, talk me through how you're doing your FHL transfer. Are you doing mostly a single incision harvesting posterior medial ankle tenodesis screw into the calp? Yeah, with a with a button. With a button. Yeah, yeah kind of. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it a uh, single incision. Um, you know, just to take take this through, um, and and you know, just fixing it with a tenodesis screw. Um, Bethany, what? How are you doing these? Are you doing these? You going to the midfoot, or you um, staying all posterior medial ankle single incision? I do my debridement first. Right. So if you don't need the length to weave it through the calc and back up to repair, to reconstruct the Achilles, then I'll take it from the posterior medial side. If you need that much length, then you go to the midfoot. Yeah. All right. So this is just kind of my schematics on, on my FHL. So, you know, harvesting it um, as distal as possible to try to maximize my, my length. This one, it looks like I harvested short. The intent was to kind of like have it flipped up, but, um, <laughs> I try to pat, you know, plantar flex my foot while I'm passing my guide pin. Cause otherwise I've run, I've gotten, as I put the guide pin in by leaving the foot at neutral, I, when I go to put it in and I have the foot plantar flexed, I start to hit the calf and it's hard to get, you know, facilitate placing placement of the tenodesis screw. So I try to remember to do that same thing before I put the Tino screw in. Uh, and then I try to, I put the guide pin in and try to avoid violating the plantar cortex. I don't know if you guys do the same thing, especially if you're using the endo button, right, Jeff, you, I, I imagine that it's super important not to violate the plantar cortex in that situation. Right. Otherwise it'll just pull back out. Any issues with heel pain? I, I like the, the idea of like the endo button, you know, with a tenodesis screw. I always worry about heel pain in those cases. Any issues that you've seen? Not as long as you put it exactly where your guide wire is there. As long as it's uh, anterior to the tuberosity, the weight-bearing surface, that tuberosity, as long as it's anterior to that, no problems. Yeah, that's a good point, I think, for, for all listening to make sure that that's in the correct spot there. And then, you know, I fixing. Like all the, I go all the way through. You go all the way through? I, I hate blind tunnels, and we've talked about this multiple times because <laughs> inevitably the tendon's too long, and then I already have my whip stitch in, and mm -hmm. I got to shorten it, and the such a pain in the ass. So I do it all the way through, put the beef pin all the way through, pull the tension and then put the, bio, the tenodesis screw yeah. in. I think you, I mean, Bethany, you, t I, I like the way that you've taught me, especially when we're talking about like post tip transfers for drop foot, where you, you pull the guide pin through, pull it in, make sure you have enough length on your tunnel that you can get it as far in as you can. And then if, if you need to, you can shorten it then. But to your point, it is a pain in the butt once you've whip stitched it to have to go back and try to get that longer. And here it's probably okay um, if you need to, I guess, unless you're using an endo button, like Jeff said, then you need to make sure that you don't violate the plantar cortex. Okay. Um, okay. So then Tino needs to screw in. This is what it's going to look like from the other side. What do you think you guys usually see in terms of a typical tendon size? And then what are you doing for your, um, like say, say it's a six millimeter diameter. What are you reaming for with your reamer in that case? Is Are you going, are you going to ream line to line? Or are you reaming um, over a little bit? I go over a little bit. Yeah. Jan, Bethany? Line to line, but I trim that. Mu so that muscle's usually really low lying. When you get it all the way down, It's it's it can get into the tunnel area. So I usually trim some of that muscle back. Yeah, I'm line line to line for this. Uh, but I, I've had it bunch up before. So like sometimes I... And I'm swearing and, you know, cussing a little bit at that point. Yep. Calc bone is soft though. I mean, I think mine. It is a little more forgiving, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, all right. And then, uh, so we talked about that, you know, another, another alternative in this case, you know, especially in a young patient with, uh, a, if you have a lot of tendon that you have to remove, you can go into the midfoot, which is a huge 
can be a big pain in the butt as we were looking at that case before going down to the knot of Henry harvesting it at that spot. That that's a bigger, it's a deeper dissection. So I use that sparingly, but you can go and do it that way. You can do drill like a transverse tunnel through the calcaneus and pull it up that way, or you can kind of go at a right angle and pull it up um, to, if you need more length, you know, as, as I'm showing it kind of in this case here. And I think that's actually what I did in this case. I felt like I needed a little more length, younger patient that I wanted a little bit more length for my tendon transfer. So talk to the, the, talk to these guys about how to make that easier. <laughs> Houston suture pastor. I mean, how do you make making that turn easy? Because that turn is hard to get. That that turn is hard to get. What I did, what I oftentimes will do is I will take a uh, Vicryl and on a big needle. And, and if, and, you know, once I get the tunnels drilled, then I can usually pass the Vicryl through that and pull it up that way um, through that area. But it is a pain for sure. And, you know, in the, I've also done just straight transverse and that obviously makes yeah. it easier um, as well. No. Yeah. I think the pull is better that way too, because then it's not as much varus pull. Yeah. I mean, but you want a little bit of that medial pull, right? I mean, you want that, you know, they say that the Achilles is supposed to have a little bit more medial preferential kind of varus pull. So I don't know, uh, maybe it depends on what the, what the foot posture is pre-op too. Uh, and then just just showing some clinical examples of what that what that might look like um here this is just a straight you know uh single incision harvest uh, showing that through the through the cow